The climate landscape has seen a drastic change in the last few years with increase in extreme climate events like heat wave and erratic rainfall. The UN Emissions Report has spoken about how emission reduction pledges by different countries are nowhere near what is needed and that combined pledges under the Paris Agreement put the world on track for around two and a half degree of warming by the end of the century. This report comes just ahead of COP27, which is starting on 6th of November in Egypt. On the show today, we'll discuss the expectations and the focus of the summit as well. Will it be climate finance? Will it be loss and damage? And what about targets of the Indian government? Joining me now to take this discussion forward is Shikha Bhasin, who is the Senior Program Lead at the Council on Energy, Environment and Water, and Professor Amit Garg of Public Systems Group, National Investment and Infrastructure Fund, Chair in Environment at Social and Corporate Governance and Fellow of IIM Ahmedabad. Also joining us is Deepak Das Gupta, Distinguished Fellow at Terry and Lead Author of IPCC Mitigation Report 2022, UNAP Emissions Report, which is published in 2022 itself. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us on CNBC TV 18 for this important discussion. Uh, well, Shikha, let me start with you first. Uh, a lot has happened in last one year. As I said, we have seen energy shocks. We have seen the war. What is the expectation from COP27 this time around, especially from the Indian government's viewpoint? What are we going to give on the table, put on the table? And what are we expecting from the global leaders? Hi, Monel. Thanks for having us and thanks for convening this really critical conversation. Um, like you said, it's been a year of immense upheaval and unfortunately not as much progress on climate ambition globally. Uh, the numbers you've already read out, so I don't need to report them again. But I think what's important for us to recognize is where did COP end uh, last year in Glasgow? So we concluded the conversation uh, with a call for greater ambition uh, towards emissions reduction. Uh, and what we've seen is that only 24 countries of all of the 197 parties that are, uh, you know, constituted within the UNFCCC's conference of parties have actually put forth uh, updated NDCs. Um, this is not a good sign. Um, the upheaval that is going on between Russia and Ukraine has allowed um, several member states of the European Union to backslide into reopening or extending uh, their coal plants' lives, uh, locking into longer uh, LNG shipment periods. Um, and I think the, this is a very critical moment for India to sort of um, flex its weight and, and demand greater ambition uh, from the developed countries on emissions reductions and their plans uh, in getting to net zero a lot faster than what has been put on the table because we know that it is not enough. And I think a second uh, point that India is going to be um, highlighting, as will all other developing countries, is, as you rightly pointed out, the entire conversation around loss and damage. Now, this is critical for India, not just globally on behalf of the developing world, but also uh, because of its domestic situation, where 75% of our districts um, lie are, or are recognized as extreme climate um, event spaces, which means that a large majority of our population is actually extremely vulnerable uh, to the impacts of climate change. And in order to address that, there needs to be progress within the negotiations where countries are coming together and developing a systematic loss and damage facility uh, to finance um, the vulnerabilities and, and the shocks that are being caused uh, both domestically and globally. Okay, take your point. And climate finance, loss and damage continues to be the big talking point. Uh, I'll discuss that in greater detail as well. But Mr. Das Gupta, let me come across to you. Uh, you have authored the recent emissions gap report as well. It mentions, and I quote, global coal emissions exceeded 2019 levels, mainly due to increased usage in China and India. And these were the two countries, one of the two countries that actually went ahead in last COP and they act changed uh, the, phase, uh, the phrase from coal phase out to coal phase down. Uh, that was a big talking point as well. We've seen a lot change since then. European countries, again, are talking about dependence on coal. Do you think there could be some change in this particular, uh, uh, this particular phrase as well? And is it possible for a developing country like India to phase out coal faster than what is expected? Yeah, thanks. Uh, coal is not the issue. <laughs> the issue is uh, coal is a minor play. The issue is how are we going to mobilize the climate uh, finances that India, many others need. We, we've got to do some dramatic things, whether it happens at COP27 
uh, is going to be the challenge. We, 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 would, we think there are six main approaches. Climate finance has to rise by about five to seven times the current levels if we are going to make a dent on uh, the emissions gap that we see. And, 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 and therefore, uh, the coal is a side distraction. I think the bigger question is, as India tries to reach its uh, uh, very ambitious targets on renewables, whether there is enough momentum happening in Article 2.1c discussions at COP27, whether we have the bandwidth or the finance uh, to react. And our take in, in the UN UNEP emissions gap report and elsewhere is there's plenty of financing in the world. Uh, you know, the size of the global financial sector is so big and relative to the share uh, and, and, and the size of financing that we need for climate, it's a matter of uh, using the tools that we have at hand to prompt the finance financial system to lead the way. And therefore, India is a critical player in that discussion. And we have, we, I'd be happy to talk about the six approaches that we have in mind. Of course, I'll, I'll take that up uh, in the next question, Mr. Das Gupta. But Mr. Garg, let me come across to you. Climate finance, as both uh, Ms. Bhasin and Mr. Das Gupta said, will be the big talking point. COP26 promised to meet target of $100 billion of climate finance by 2023. First of all, is that enough? Uh, as Mr. Das Gupta said, a 5%, 5 to 7% increase is needed. And secondly, in G20, India spoke about need to restructure IMF and World Bank to address the climate uh, finance issues. What is your take on this and what should India be talking about in this COP? Yeah, so climate finance requirement is huge, I would say. So India itself may need about $10 trillion for managing our climate change impacts so, and, and mitigation. So that is one thing. I think what we are looking at, $100 billion is good, but we are not planning to leverage it well. That is what my worry is. We are not creating low-cost financing solutions, which are possible to be done. These are known to the world. You see, if a project, green project, is to be funded in a developed country, they receive funding at 2 to 3%. But if the same type of project is to be, is to be funded in a developing country, they receive 8 to 12% of finance, uh, 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 cost of finance. So where is the equity? Where is the justice in this? You see, the countries that need most of the finance or more of the finance on mitigation adaptation, they have been rated very low, triple B, double B. So finance will not come to them. So I think the whole financial structure, we have to think about it. And we have to see that how can we get financing from the developed countries to, let us say, multilateral development bank at a low cost. That is very much important. And on energy, coal and other things, my take is any energy is better than no energy. Hmm. So if Europe is fixing, going back to coal, because they need energy. Hmm. And if we are working on coal, it is because it is our natural resource what we have. I do not know of any big country or any country for that matter who is not using their natural resources, natural domains. So if some country is using shale gas, they have a lot of shale gas. If some country is using gas, they are having a lot of gas. So if a country is using coal, we are having a lot of coal and we have to provide energy for our huge population. We have to provide housing for all, education for all, health for all, luxury for all, hmm. how will it provide without coal? Not possible. Okay, so some energy is better than no energy is the word coming in from Mr. Garg. Uh, Ms. Bazin, let me come to you. I was reading a CEW report and it said no developed nation uh, mentioned loss and damage in their NDCs. Out of 66 countries that did mention loss and damage, 93% belong to the global south. Of course, as you mentioned, this has to be discussed this time around as well. Uh, but is there an accepted set of indicator to determine the amount? Uh, what kind of condition should be put to it? 
So, Sonal, actually, that's part of the problem. I mean, loss and damage has been something that's uh, been tabled within the negotiations for the better part of the last 10 years now. Uh, and the reason that progress when it comes to indicators and institutional support as well as um, you know attributable science to particular climatic events all of this actually needs encouragement and by slowing the conversation within the negotiations around loss and damage uh, the world has systematically slowed progress on each of these um, aspects of creating indicators um, you know creating the finance uh, knowing how much is really needed as well as the progress on science that will be able to attribute every climatic, uh, every natural disaster to uh, climate change in the capacity that it is actually connected. Um, and so it's actually been a very clever ploy to just slow it down uh, by keeping it on the negotiation table rather than moving forward on it. Um, but as the study that you have just alluded to highlights, um, the other part of the problem here is that because it is only a developing country problem that is being uh, put forth by the Global South, um, it's also um, recognizing that the capacity constraints to be able to arrive at those data points, to be able to arrive at that science, to be able to arrive and say that, look, this is the amount of money that we need. This is how much it is costing us. Um, all of that gets slowed uh, because it is primarily in the interest of the developing economies and equity um, is not uh, really uh, the norm that we're seeing being followed within the climate negotiations today. Okay, so lack of uh, regulation and higher cost of funding is, are the two things that you mentioned, uh, Mr. Garg and uh, Ms. Bhasin, that is. Mr. Das Gupta, let me take that to you. What do you think? Uh, you said, yes, there is enough capital, but distribution has been an issue. What, according to you, have been the issues? And the six points that you mentioned, which one do you think takes the, uh, you know, which will take press over others and which should be uh, which should be actually done right away in COP27 itself. Yeah, <clears throat> there are two, three things that's got to happen. One is simply we've got to get much more practical, tangible, and strategic. And that that's not just us, we in India, but globally we need to think much more strategically. Finance is not something simply because you ask for it, it comes. You've got to move on several levers at critical points of time to make it happen. And we know it, we can make it happen. It's a question of the tactics and the question of how much partnerships work. And it's a global financial system we are after. So there are six things that's very critical. The first is a lever that we've been using, which is getting markets to work. Financial market systems have lots of efficiency problems, and we're trying to make it more efficient to reach climate financing goals. <clears throat> and this is about all that has to do with taking climate risk into account. <clears throat> so that's the first challenge. And, and there, there's been a lot of progress, SEBI and others, and globally what's been happening with the task force on climate disclosure, that's moving, but that's not going to be enough. The second thing that we've got to work is start thinking about carbon prices, because governments around the world need resources in order to be able to work with climate. And there are ways in which you can structure that carbon financing much minimum floors. You make it much higher floors possible in countries that can afford that and, and lower. So kind of graded ways, but you need it because you need to give a signal and you need to uh, get the public resources. Okay. Beha sorry, third is behavioral change. If it's not going to happen without the behavioral changes and you need to work on that and not least of all you've got to get markets which is public actions to work and ending up with things like the joint the the just energy transition uh, uh, programs that the g7 is working with uh, big players like india is possibly one of them so think about making sure that markets know what is being asked for and that they respond and that's the challenge not uh, not just generally asking for things which are not going to happen so that's the challenge ahead of us we cop 27 is going to be a start of a process it's not going to end with uh, agreements on any one thing that's going to deliver the goods thank okay. you <laughs> Uh, Mr. Das Gupta, but you spoke about carbon pricing. Recently, the government did come out, come out with some draft rules. Do you think that is something that will at least start the solution of the problem? 
I think it's got to be a mutually agreed. It's got to be something that's got to going to be have to have discussions. It's not going to be one uh, country doing it. It's got got to be a fairly graded, carefully done amongst, and it's only one of six. So we've got to get a, a kind of agreement that we need. We mean business. We need to change climate finances, and that's only going to be one tool. Minimum carbon prices is something that's there. Government will be negotiating and discussing many of many this amongst many other options at COP27 and beyond. Okay, all right. We'll continue this discussion, but please don't go anywhere. For now, we'll take a short break and the discussion continues on the other side. Welcome back. You're tuned into Climate Clock on CNBC TV 18, and this is our special COP27 discussion that continues. Uh, we have with us Mr. Garg, Mr. Das Gupta, and Ms. Bhasin. Oh, well, this next question is to you, Mr. Garg. Uh, let me talk about the emissions report because it has just come ahead of COP27 and has talk, uh, spoken about some alarming signals as well. It talks about uh, the fact that emissions are reducing, but efforts are still not sufficient to limit global temperature rise to one and a half degrees. According to you, what should India do in this regard? Because India has been named one of the uh, top uh, countries to be, you know, contributing to this particular emission target. We have made big announcements in the last COP. Do we need to rejig emission reduction goals of 45% by 2030, or these are enough? Or what else should India talk about in its NDCs? Global emissions are 55 billion ton every year now. India's contribution is hardly 3 billion ton per year. So if somebody says that India is contributing too much, I will not agree. That is point number one. Number two, India's 45% of GHG upon GDP reduction in 2005 to 2030 is a very strong target, very ambitious target. 50% of an electric capacity coming from non-fossil sources is also a very, very steep target India has taken. So it is not that we have to be very uh, uh, more ambitious. We are already very, very ambitious. Now, uh, what the world has to do, developed countries and some emerging economies have to do much more than what they have been doing. If 2050 is to be global net zero, and China has said 2060 is their net zero, India has said 2070 is their net zero, then a, even a third standard student knows that net zero equal to net negative plus net positive. So if two big economies, what uh, uh, this emission gap report is saying, are not going to be net zero in 2050, then somebody has to be net negative in 2050. And we know whom we are talking about. They have to be net negative very, very strongly. They have to come out with their plans. If they are not coming out, the global commons, global environment has to lose. Hmm. And to the last question on finance, I have two very simple solutions. Multilateral development banks have something called call-in capital. So call-in capital is what OECD countries give to them. Presently, about nine big MDBs have call-in capital of $119 billion. And against this, they can raise callable capital, that is, raise loans, blended finance, all those things. So if developed countries make this 119 to 200, they can raise around a trillion dollar more, and that will be good enough every year for funding. Hmm. So this is very much required. The third point and my last point is, there has to be some projects that are green everywhere, whether in USA or Europe or China or India or England, they are green everywhere. So we have to be common green taxonomy. If we want to have common taxonomy, that is difficult. But common minimum ground taxonomy should has, has to be decided all over the world and they should be provided, run through low-cost green financing. Hmm. Okay. I stop so, you. So low uh, low cost green financing, green taxonomy, uh, certain things that need to be considered in this COP as well. Uh, Ms. Basin, let me come to you. We 
talk about climate finance and of course a flow of sustainable finance is something that will help us keep up on the pledges that we have made countries like India. Do you think if that doesn't flow through because so far we have been doing it with internal accruals, it could actually uh, hamper the progress that we've been making so far? And if not, what are the projects, what are the technologies do you think uh, that we should be focusing on? Uh, that this money that comes through, uh, should it be used more on climate technologies or there should be technology sharing as well? Um, so, Sonar, I think there's a few things to bear in mind, and I think historical responsibility, I really want to reiterate that point, right? Because if you think about what was supposed to have happened by 2020, uh, you know, there were pledges that were made related to climate finance, but there were also significant pledges and commitments that were made relating to emissions reduction. Uh, and if you actually take out the economies in transition, which is essentially your erstwhile USSR, you find that the developed world actually reduced its emissions by less than 4% by 2020. Um, so the level of ambition that is therefore thrust on countries like India is completely um, misguided and baseless. Um, that's one point. The second point is that if we really are looking to um, multilateralism to be able to solve for the global common as well as the global challenge that climate change uh, has put forth to all of us. I think um, recognizing that climate finance as well as technology cooperation as well as capacity building, you know, an area that is actually um, often overlooked in the polity king. I think these are three very critical areas that need to be pushed forward um, as a collective if we are going to be able to really come out on the other side. Um, to answer the counterfactual, uh, and of course I do believe in multilateralism, which is why I do what I do, uh, but the counterfactual question that you are posing, that what if this finance does not actually accrue, uh, you know, what happens then? Um, I think it will be a scramble, you know, the way that we are today, where there is an absolute uh, level of uh, mistrust as well as no sense of accountability in terms of what has been promised, what has been pledged mm. uh, versus what is actually being delivered on. I think we're just going to continue in this deadlock um, and you will see an increasing number of partnerships arising on the outside of what is considered COP today uh, to be able to try and solve for it. You know, you will see greater technology partnerships as well as financing partnerships taking place amongst bilateral and multilateral countries, uh, but we lose the essence of mm really coming together within the purview of the UNFCCC uh, to solve for this global right. challenge. Take your point, Ms. Basin. Uh, short of time, so Mr. Das Gupta, last question to you. Uh, your uh, response to what I just asked, Ms. Basin, and your closing comments as well. Yeah, we, we're trying to work towards a solution that is feasible. We think a solution is feasible. And I agree that what happens at COP is then you get very intense discussions which go to the edges and not solutions. And therefore, India in a G20 upcoming leadership, India as the biggest player in some senses amongst the developing countries, the challenges that they're going to be facing, India has the deep financial uh, capabilities to be able to be a bridge between the divides that uh, are affecting us. And I'm hopeful that we will see many more things happening, not perhaps at the kind of headline levels of the divisions that are always talked about, but working towards collaborative, cooperative outcomes. And it, by all means, it can take many shapes and forms. One of the things that's going to be important to discuss is the G7 uh, uh, Just Transition Energy Partnership. It's going to be important, but it's we've got to think of the multilateral solutions. We've got to think of the adaptation solutions. We've got to be doubling the adaptation size of financial resources. But all this happening at a time when we are in an energy sector crisis globally right now, and central banks are raising, even as we're talking today or tomorrow, we're going to see some actions again from the Fed on the central banks. So these are conditions which are going to be difficult. But within this, I remain optimistic that uh, we will find the right solutions okay. uh, if we put our minds to it. Thanks. Okay, that is everyone's hopes, uh, hope as well. Thank you, Mr. Das Gupta, Mr. Garg, and Ms. Bhasin to join us and discuss this uh, important topic. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us. And with that, it is a wrap on this edition of Climate Clock. News continues on CNBC TV 18. Stay tuned.